If you ever want to make some kind of automatic storage for your items or collection for your farms, then you'll have to know how hoppers, droppers, and dispensers work. Hello everyone, my name's MD, and welcome back to Practical Redstone Reloaded, a series in which I teach you how redstone works so you can design your own farms and contraptions. In this episode, we'll be looking at the heart of storage tech, the core components that make it all work, and how we can use them. We'll start with the dropper. The dropper is a full, conductive block that is directional and can face any of its six sides. You can identify it by the smiley face when it's facing the sides, and the square opening when it's facing up or down. The mouth or opening is the output side of the dropper. When you right click a dropper, it'll open a GUI, revealing 9 slots of storage, and by the nature of it being a block entity, it is also immovable. But storage isn't exactly what this block is used for, since as we know, the dropper is a redstone component. So let's put some items in the dropper and give it some redstone power, shall we? As you can see, when a dropper gets activated, it spits out a single item from its storage slots and fires it in its output direction. If there's no item in the dropper to be fired, it'll make an empty click sound as opposed to its normal firing noise. A dropper will always fire the item in its output direction with a little random velocity vertically and horizontally, even if it's facing a block and the item spawns inside. However, if the block the dropper is facing is a container block, or if the block has a container entity in it, then the dropper will insert the item into the container instead of dropping it, and it makes no noise when doing so. Even if the dropper fails to actually transfer the item, for example if the container it's facing is full, or doesn't support the item, then it will still fire silently. If we freeze the game and power a dropper, we can see that it takes a while to actually drop the item. Four game ticks to be precise. Remember when we discussed tick phases last episode? Well droppers use scheduled ticks to fire four game ticks after being powered. And because of this, the fastest you can fire a dropper is once every 4 game ticks, which when you divide the 72,000 game ticks in an hour by 4, gives you 18,000 items per hour. This number will come in handy in the future, so it's good if you remember it. Now let's play a game. I have a stack of diamonds and a stack of emeralds in this dropper, in slots 1 and 2 respectively. Now when I power it, which item should I get? Logically, it should be the diamonds since that's the first item in the dropper. But if you actually try it, you find you will get the diamonds, sometimes. Let me explain. When a dropper has to fire an item, it doesn't always take the first slot item. Instead, the dropper will select a random slot between the ones that have items and fire that. What this means is that if you have 3 slots with items, the chance of one of those items being fired is 1 in 3. The same all the way to 9 slots where it's 1 in 9. Combined with hoppers, which we'll discuss later, this makes a very simple randomizer which has an adjustable chance from 1 in 2 to 1 in 9 or even 8 in 9. You can mix a selection of stackable and non-stackable items in the dropper, and then by taking a comparator readout of the hopper, you can tell when a non-stackable gets selected because it has the signal strength of a full stack, which in a hopper is 3. So the output for your randomizer would be anything after the first dust. That's most of what you need to know about the dropper, so let's look at its brother, the dispenser. Dispensers are very, very similar to droppers in a lot of ways, such as the placement style, facing directions, block properties, and GUI. The first obvious difference you'll notice is the texture. Dispensers have an O-shaped mouth and when facing up or down, the opening is still a hole. This is likely because when they were first added, dispensers could only shoot arrows and other projectiles. If you put items into a dispenser and then activate it, for most items the dispenser will shoot it just like a dropper would, again with the same 4 game take delay. Unlike a dropper, however, a dispenser cannot transfer those items into a container, but will instead spit them out into the block space. So if you're wondering why your dropper chain isn't working, it's probably because it's not a dropper. That's not what makes dispensers unique though. Their utility comes with the fact that they can use certain items the way a player would if they right clicked. I'll go through a few of the more useful cases, but you can find the whole list on the wiki, as there are quite a few. Dispensers can fire projectiles of all kinds. This includes arrows, splash and lingering potions, XP bottles, snowballs, eggs and wind charges. They can also place fluid and powder snow buckets, as well as pick them up with an empty bucket. If a dispenser is facing an entity that can equip armor, elytra, or any wearable item, then if the dispenser has one of those items, it will equip the entity with them. This also applies to carved pumpkins, heads, and skulls. Also note that if the dispenser thinks the carved pumpkin or wither skull could complete a golem or wither structure, it will place the pumpkin or skull in the world. If the dispenser has a boat and is facing water or a waterlogged block, or the space above water or a waterlogged block, then it will place the boat facing the same direction as itself. Dispensers can also apply bone meal to any plants it's facing, and to really anything that supports bone meal, like moss. 
If there's no block to be bone meal, then no bone meal is used and it only fires particles. Shulker boxes can be placed in the world by a dispenser. I can't imagine storage tech without it. Fire charges are fired like blaze fireballs, not gas fireballs. These can only set things on fire. Fireworks are fired in a similar way. Flint and steel can also be dispensed, but they can only set fire to the block in front of them and light a portal if facing into an obsidian frame. All types of minecarts can be placed if the dispenser is facing any type of rail or the space above a rail. TNT is dispensed as an entity as if you place the block and lit it, but it can also spawn inside a block this way. Shears can be used on bogged, sheep, snow golems, mushrooms, or even on a full beehive or nest block to harvest honeycomb. Again, for any interaction with entities, the entity just has to have a part of its hitbox intersect the block the dispenser is facing. A dispenser can also place armor stands in the space they are facing. Empty bottles can be filled with water if facing a waterlogged or water block, or with honey if facing a full beehive or nest. The bottle is dropped if there's no room in the dispenser for the filled bottle. Note, this also applies to buckets. That's about it. Oh wait, no, how could I forget? Droppers and dispensers are one of the few components that are affected by quasi connectivity, just like pistons. So even setups like these still work. But do note, unlike pistons which provide block updates when extending, droppers and dispensers do not send block updates when activated, so you need to provide an update for setups like these to work. Now with those two out of the way, let's look at the block that makes almost all of storage tech possible, and one of the more deceivingly complex blocks in the game, the hopper. Hoppers are non-full, non-conductive storage containers that can pick up and transfer items. The shape and behavior of a hopper changes slightly depending on how you place it. It consists of two parts mainly, the bowl and the spout. The bowl is fixed and it's this top part of the hopper that acts as the input. The spout is this little bit at the bottom that faces the block you place the hopper against. The spout is the output of the hopper, so make sure it's facing where you want the items to go. Speaking of items, when you right click a hopper, it opens a GUI where you can see 5 slots. This is sometimes convenient because each full slot gives a signal strength of 3. But again, the storage capacity of this block is not what makes it useful, so let's talk about it. Hoppers have 3 main functions. Pick up items, pull items from containers, and transfer items into containers. These are fairly easy to understand, so let's begin. A hopper can pick up item entities whose hitbox intersects the block space above them, or inside the bowl of the hopper. It'll only pick them up if there's space for that item inside it, whether it's a partially filled or empty slot. Anything over the capacity will be ignored. If there is a container block on top of the hopper, the hopper will not check for item entities, but will instead scan the container for items if they can enter the hopper or fill a partial slot, and will pull that item in one by one. Hoppers can also pull from container entities like chess boats, chess carts, and hopper carts. Do note that these entities will also stop the regular dropped item check from happening. There's also another way to stop the item check in recent versions, and that's by simply putting a full block above the hopper. All full blocks except beehives and nests do this as they are part of the does not block hoppers tag, and need hoppers to pick up items that spawn inside the block. A full block above will not stop the hopper from checking for and accessing container entities though. Finally, the transfer function of the hopper. It's quite simple. Take the first item in the hopper and try to put it in the container the hopper spout is facing, if there is one. If the first item cannot transfer, then try the second slot item, then the third, and so on. Now you have an idea of what the hopper does, but to fully understand it and how to use it, we need to go a little deeper into how it works. The actual process is a bit complex as you can see by this flowchart by Do Not To Name, but I'll cover the important bits and if you're interested, I'll link the flowchart below for you to refer to. Additionally, there is a video by my friend Nico that explores the functioning of hoppers in more depth that I will link as well. It's a part of a storage tech series and I would recommend checking it out. We'll start with the concept of a ticking block entity. Hoppers are ticking block entities, which means that as long as they are loaded, the game will check every game tick if they need to perform an action. When a hopper does get ticked, it first checks if it's on cooldown. If it is, then only the cooldown is reduced by 1 and nothing else happens in the hopper, and the game moves on to process the next one. If the hopper is not on cooldown and is not receiving redstone power, then it first checks if it's pointing into a container, and if that container is not full, it tries putting one item from its inventory into the container. The way it checks the slots is always the same, top to bottom, left to right. So it tries slot 1, 2, 3, and so on, and when it reaches the end, it loops back to the next row. If the first slot item can't be transferred, then it tries the next slot, till no more are left. Next, the hopper checks if there's an inventory above it. 
whether that be a container block or container entities. It checks each slot in them for items it can pull, and similar to how it pushes items, it pulls items in the same way, top to bottom, left to right. If there's no input inventory above the hopper, it'll instead search for item entities in its bowl or the block above it. If it finds an item it can fit inside it, it'll pick up the item. If there is a stack of items and the hopper can't fit them all, it'll take as many of that item as it can fit and then leave the rest. If at any point in this process the hopper successfully moved or picked up an item, then it'll send comparator updates around itself and set its cooldown to 8 game ticks. Another important thing to note is if a hopper pushes an item into another hopper, it'll set that hopper's cooldown to 8 game ticks as well. Some key takeaways from this. First, hoppers get processed every tick, so item pickup can happen almost instantly, but they also have a cooldown of 8 game ticks every time they process an item. So when actually running, a hopper can only transfer an item every 8 game ticks, which gives us 9000 items an hour. That's an important number to remember, and it's often called hopper speed, as it's usually the speed of hoppers that controls how fast you can handle items. Second, hoppers only handle one item and one entity at a time. If you have a bunch of item entities above a hopper, they won't all be picked up at once, but instead after the first entity gets picked up, the hopper goes on cooldown. When it comes to pulling and pushing items to and from containers, a hopper can only do a single item at a time, so it can pick up a full stack of items at a shot, but the hopper can only drain those items once every 8 game ticks. The same speed applies to draining containers. Third, since having a container block, or entity, above a hopper stops it from checking for items, you'll often see people covering the exposed hoppers with things like droppers or composters, or even pots. This is simply a minor lag reduction, as stopping the check for items saves a little processing time and power, especially in large quantities. Even if the effects aren't as noticeable, it's still considered good practice, especially since it avoids any unwanted items accidentally getting into your systems if they happen to drop in. Fourth, if you provide redstone power to a hopper, whether directly or just activating it, through a conductive block, then all the hopper's functions are skipped entirely. No pickup or transfer of items. In this state, the hopper is said to be locked, and it is by far the best way to reduce passive lag from hoppers that are not actively used. This is why you'll see large storage systems have a hopper locking system to save on compute power when not being used but still loaded. Again, this is mainly good practice and is not absolutely necessary. Last but not least, it is important to remember that hoppers push before they pull. This comes into play when understanding certain sorting systems. Now that we have an understanding of how a hopper works, let's look at how they are used. Hoppers interact the way you would expect with containers like chests, barrels, and chest boats and carts. But there are certain blocks like the brewing stand and furnace variants that make a hopper work differently depending on the side they are facing. In furnace variants, a hopper pointing into the top puts items into the ingredient slot, whereas a hopper pointing into any of the sides will instead try to input items into the fuel slot. If the item isn't a fuel, then it can't be put in. A hopper at the bottom will pull items from the output slot as you'd imagine. A similar thing happens in brewing stands. A hopper into the top will input potion ingredients, while a hopper into the side can input bottles and blaze powder. A hopper below will pull out any bottles that are in the stand. Composters can only accept an input from the top and an output from below. Hoppers can also input items into container entities like chest and hopper carts if the spout of the hopper is facing the block the cart's hitbox is in. Now before we wrap things up, I just want to quickly explain the basic functioning of a standard item filter as it is by far the most used redstone build. This impulse item filter works using two main functions, the filter and the drain. The top hopper here as you can see is not powered by anything and is always ready to pick up an item. However, its slots are filled with the filter item and some block items, so nothing but the filter items can get in. This by itself can technically filter items, but it can only pick up 63, after which it's useless. We need some way to drain the items that the filter picks up so it has space for more. So how do we do that? Well naturally, by putting another hopper below. But this presents another problem. That hopper will drain everything non-stop. We can prevent that by simply powering that hopper with a redstone line. This begs the question, how is the redstone line supposed to unlock the hopper when there are items to drain? Well, as you know already, the answer is a comparator reading the filter. As soon as the total number of items in the filter crosses 22, the comparator will read a power level of 2, and if it crosses 45, it will read 3. So with our filter set up as 18 1, 1, 1, 1, we can connect the output of the comparator to a redstone torch that locks the bottom hopper, so as soon as it gets another item the power level increases and the torch turns off, unlocking the drain hopper till the filter resets. The compact way of doing this is this tiny SS2 filter, 
where SS2 stands for signal strength 2. And you'd think you can just build multiple side by side, but these filters have a big flaw. If built side by side, also called tiling, then if one filter picks up a big stack of items, the comparator will read a power level of 3 that bleeds over to the adjacent cells and causes their items to drain without actually picking up anything. This is a big problem, but it actually has a very simple fix. Just add an extra redstone dust. Et voila! You have the SS3 filter, also called the Impulse Sorter, after Impulse SV who first popularized it. The reason this works is that even if the first lot has a full stack, it can only ever read a power level of 3, and will never bleed over. The only downside is you have more filter items, as it drains to 41, and that reduces the pickup batch capacity. Do know that you should never put extra items in the filter slots for a tileable setup, as that will cause the power to bleed over. That's all I wanted to cover in this video, but I do want to mention again that if you are interested in storage tech specifically and want to learn more starting from the basics, the ongoing series by Nico and his community covers the subject well, so do check it out. But without further ado, on to the exercises. The first one is a classic, the Smart Dropper. A Smart Dropper is a dropper that activates whenever it has items inside it and continues to fire until those items are cleared. There are many ways you can do this including different speeds, either single or double hopper speed depending on how many inputs the dropper has. Try your hand at making designs for the given footprints. You can use any of the components we have covered in this series till now. Building upon that, the next exercise is a dropper elevator, but more specifically a silent dropper beater. Remember that a dropper does not make a noise when it successfully transfers an item to a container. So in this exercise, you have to make sure that the dropper only gets activated when it has the item to transfer. Diving a bit more into storage tech, try designing a simple shulker box loader as well as a box unloader. The loader should have an input for shulker boxes, an input for items, and an output for fill boxes. The unloader would have an input for fill boxes, an output for items, and an output for empty boxes. The size of the build doesn't really matter as long as it functions. Once you have a working design, you can try to simplify and compact it as much as you can. You'll likely be reinventing some existing designs, but don't let that deter you. Finally, you can try your hand at AB tileable item filters. Remember how we discussed that SS2 filters can't be tiled since adjacent slices would interfere? Well, that's not entirely true, because SS2 filters can be designed such that you alternate between two designs that don't interact with each other at all. We call them design A and design B, and when you put them together, you get AB tiling. However, there's not just one way of making an AB tiling SS2 filter. There are multiple ways you can mix and match them, so your exercise is to design as many of these filters as you can. These filters can be used in a number of places, and they are better than SS3 filters because of the larger capacity, but come at the cost of being slightly less easy to build. With that, we come to the end of the video. If you have any questions or want to share your exercise attempts, then make sure to join the Nooptech Discord and grab the practical redstone tag to access the channels. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.